on. Yep. Green is on. financial viability. And I commend both of those uh, entities for your uh, thorough analysis. Uh, given the Postal Service's currently dire situation, both of these reports rightfully touch on some critical and highly controversial issues, such as calling for major changes in the frequency of mail delivery, statutory pricing, facility and network optimization, and employee compensation and benefits. I think we all get the fact that the difficult times will require some difficult decisions to be made and the impact of some of these decisions will more than likely fall heavily across the board, affecting the Postal Service, its customers, employees, stakeholders, and others. While at the moment there may not be exactly a consensus on what needs to be done to bring about the financial recovery of the Postal Service, the one thing we believe we are all in agreement on is that doing nothing is no longer a viable option. The keystone of a $1.2 trillion mailing industry and the employer of nearly 700,000 Americans, the solvency and long-term operation of the United States Postal Service is essential to our national economy and to our way of life, which, was, which is why I'm glad that today's hearing gives us an opportunity to lay everything from the value of mail nowadays to the debate over the Postal Service's civil service retirement system 
out on the table for deliberation and consideration. I appreciate today's witnesses for being here with us this morning to offer their suggested strategies on how best to increase revenue, reduce costs, and improve efficiency going forward in order to help ensure the future financial viability of the Postal Service. Again, I'd like to thank the Chairman, uh, Mr. Towns, for agreeing to hold this joint hearing, and I look forward to an informative discussion this morning. On our first panel, we will hear from Postal Service and GAO on the reports, while our second panel will discuss the impact of these recommendations and the CSRS pension issues. Again, I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to the testimony. And I now yield five minutes to our ranking member, Mr. Darrell Issa from California, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, last year we worked together on a bipartisan basis to provide a temporary fix. This committee had hoped that that fix would be slightly longer. However, at the end of the day, it was a one-year kick-the-can-down-the-road fix. Today, it is clear that before any fix of any sort is considered by this committee, we must have a plan that will bring right-sizing, solvency, and <clears throat> excuse me, a continued level of high service by the post office. Without that level of high service, we do not meet our constitutional responsibility, which this committee has direct oversight on. Without right-sizing the services versus the people versus the equipment versus, and I'm going to cross the line that we never want to cross, versus the number of physical locations around the country manned by postal personnel, we cannot cannot get even. For more than 30 years, I have been either an executive or a member of the board of a company. I still sit on a public company. We are the fiduciaries of your enterprise. As fiduciaries of your enterprise, we must tell you, you have, at the current time, more or less a third more people than you are properly using if you were to use the minimum amount of people highly motivated, properly compensated, you would clearly have a dramatic amount less people. Having said that, we have been remiss from the dais in meeting our responsibility. During the last year since we began dealing specifically under this chairmanship with uh, this problem, the federal workforce has grown by nearly as many, if not more, than the amount of people that you're a surplus. Postal workers are federal workers. Postal workers are vested in a, an equivalent system and a transferable system to that which we here on the dais and all federal workers are in. Although there are some slight differences, it is very clear that we have not recognized that if the postal system has more workers than it needs, the federal workforce in general has less than it needs, postal workers represent what is is or has been a highly motivated, fairly compensated group of individuals at all levels, entry, managerial, supervisorial, managerial, and executive. I hope today, in addition to the prepared statements that we, will, we, have, we have read and we will hear uh, capsulated, that we will hear about the kind of synergies the federal government needs to achieve in duties, and from the dais, many have suggested that the census should have been done all or in part by those federal workers uh, presently working for the post office, and other innovative ideas that could be done to make better use of postal facilities. But more importantly, you must leave here today understanding that Congress needs a plan, like any other board of directors, that passes the sniff test that will, in fact, be reasonable for us to say to the American people, the post office will be self-sufficient and solvent, which is a requirement of Congress, but more importantly, that we're not wasting the time and energies of so many people who have in the past been well-motivated, well loyal workers to the postal system by simply saying, sit in a green room, blue room, any color room you have, but today, many of them sit in waiting rooms. Nothing is more demoralizing to a worker than to be excess with no plan to deal with that in the future. No postal worker should be given a route that is less than a full day's work. No postal worker should be on the ready if, in fact, that ready bell is not likely to, to ring. So, Mr. Chairman, 
I have been supportive of the postal workers. I intend to continue to be. But I want to make sure that we are doing the best thing we can for those people. And if the American people are watching us hire throughout the Federal workforce, people who with the transition funds that we could authorize and appropriate could find themselves in permanent positions, I do not want to wait until it is time to put people on the street who otherwise would be gamefully employed in the Federal service that they signed up for one, two, five, twenty or thirty years ago. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the comments and I look forward to working together on a bipartisan basis to fix this troubling problem. Yield back. I thank the gentleman by prior agreement. The Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Kucinich uh, for five minutes. I thank uh, the Chairman for holding the hearing on this matter of great significance to the American people. I want to begin by thanking the men and women who have dedicated their lives to making sure that the commerce of this nation moves through the mail that you have, uh, many of you made a life commitment to that work. And it ought to be received with uh, great appreciation by this Congress and by the American people. Uh, the financial issues that are facing the Postal Service uh, will be dealt with. And I'm hopeful that this committee will have the opportunity to deal with it in a way that preserves the good faith which the people who serve the United States Postal Service have a right to expect uh, from this Congress and will preserve the appreciation which the American people have for, the, for those who are involved in the delivery of the mail. Uh, I understand the importance to local communities of the Postal Service. And I'm committed to working with all stakeholders to ensure its financial viability. In November of last year, this subcommittee held a hearing to examine possible methods of revenue generation. And we know that since then we've seen um, a great amount of money uh, continue to be lost and the postal consolidation campaigns persist. I'm concerned that some of the proposals being considered could lead to the privatization of essential services. And as someone who's had to deal with privatization issues uh, many years ago as a mayor of a city, I can uh, promise you that this is one member who's not going to sit by and let you use uh, the excuse of uh, financial difficulties as a path to privatize a, uh, a service that first and foremost ought to be a commitment to the American people of, uh, of regular delivery of the mail at a, at a fair and reasonable price. Uh, I strongly believe there are ways to generate revenue without cutting jobs and essential services. The GAO report uh, makes the observation that 300,000 postal employees are expected to retire through uh, 2020. It points out that uh, uh, that in a three-year period, over 84,000 employees uh, were reduced from the career workforce. So it's not as though people aren't looking for ways to operate uh, more efficiently with less people. We've got to be careful that we don't, uh, through the desire to try to make the system work more uh, efficiently, uh, harm its ability to deliver the mail. My constituents continue to express their concern over post office closing, especially in low-income communities with little or no access to transportation or technology. Ultimately, it's going to be up to the Congress to give Postal Service the flexibility it needs to implement vital revenue generation methods. At the same time, it's our responsibility to ensure that methods of revenue generation do not come at the cost of universal access and the jobs that are vital to the communities we represent. Because universal access is something that's important to the people of this country. And it is a, it is a, a major economic issue in communities across America. And it should not be denied to people because they happen to be on the lower end of the economic uh, uh, ladder. The Postal Service has a very powerful infrastructure already in place. And that should be utilized in any future plan. Instead of consolidating branches and its workforce, the Postal Service should examine ways to provide services and training for its employees that would allow it to compete well, with some of the other entities that are already out there. 
uh, Chairwoman Goldway and National Postal Worker Unions have provided excellent ideas that warrant further examination, uh, such as providing government services at local post offices and providing retailers a space to sell their services or products. As the economy moves towards recovery, we must ensure that local post offices are there to serve the local community. I thank the Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the uh, Postal Subcommittee uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I, I do appreciate the bipartisan approach in, in working uh, on these issues. And I do appreciate the efforts uh, that the Postal Service has made. Uh, I, I'm new to this as a freshman here. Uh, and I've actually got to tell you that I, I was pleasantly surprised and appreciative of the fact of how the Postal Service has been addressing the financial needs in a very proactive way, in a very difficult way, um, but being financially responsible and having that at the top of their agenda. There are difficult decisions to be made. Uh, they're going to be painful any way you slice it. But I only wish that every, every other agency within the federal government would be as uh, responsive to the financial needs within their their agency and their department uh, as the Postal Service ha has been. Again, they're upside down financially and, and struggling, um, but again, I wish other departments and agencies would have the same type of approach in being responsible, making difficult decisions, and, and making the cuts that need to be, uh, need to be there. Um, I also do believe that we need to continue to the discussion on the relevancy of the Postal Service and making it more relevant in the business community, making it more relevant in people's lives, and how to drive revenue. We've had good discussions and we'll continue to have good hard discussions about where to cut costs, um, but we also need to continue that discussion about how to become more, uh, more innovative and how do, we, how do we service the American people uh, in a better way that will actually drive revenue forward. Uh, personally, I have deep concerns about the move from a six-day delivery uh, down to a five-day delivery. I think there should be a blend. My personal approach to this is that we should give you some flexibility to find quote-unquote postal holidays so that you can have the flexibility to take the least, uh, the days that we know that there is less demand and, and less need in the marketplace to actually deliver. But to say that we're going to eliminate 52 days of service is not going to necessarily going to drive volume forward. I don't think uh, eliminating Saturday delivery before the Christmas holiday is necessarily wise. When you look at the fact that we have uh, Mother's Day on a Sunday, I don't think that the marketplace is going to be very happy about not being able to deliver mail on Saturday. Um, I also, if you look at it, in a given year, we'll have eight or nine holidays where you will not have service uh, on a Monday or a Friday because there is a national holiday. So there, there are eight or nine weeks out of the year where we would go for three days with no postal delivery services. And there are many unintended consequences for credit card bills and, and medicine that may be delivered through the mail and those types of things that I think they need to be more thoroughly explained. And again, I, I would hope that we would explore a blend where we give you some flexibility to find that Saturday in August that nobody's going to miss it but also, um, and so you can trim costs. The other thing, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I, that I hope we look at is I still believe that this country lacks an, an energy policy. Uh, we, if you look at the, the fuel prices in January of 2009, they were less than $2 a gallon. Now, at least in Utah, I'm paying more than $3 a gallon. This country does not have an energy policy. And when we have rising energy costs, one of the consequences is a tremendous expense to the Postal Service in the delivery of its goods and services. Obviously, the biggest thing out there that we've got to talk about that's difficult is, is labor. When you have 80% of your expenses tied up in the labor pool, there are going to have to be some very difficult decisions and discussions. Uh, we, I know we have some tough uh, labor negotiations that are, that are coming up. Uh, we need to talk about right-sizing the Postal Service and dealing with that. And as uh, uh, Congressman Issa talked about, it would be better and best if we could make some of the transition and the astronomical growth we have in the, in the uh, other departments and agencies and being able to transition some of the good federal workers there at the Postal Service into other uh, applicable jobs. And I, I would hope that we would do a better job of making those transitions. And, and then certainly one of the big things that I want to more thoroughly understand, Mr. Chairman, is the CSRS, uh, you know, the pension issues that we have out there because that overfunding issue is something that 
we can't just deal with on a Band-Aid on a year-by-year -year basis, but as, as Ranking Member Issa said, we've got to deal with it in a long-term fashion. So those are some of my thoughts and perspectives. Uh, I look forward to this discussion, an ongoing discussion, and, and appreciate the bipartisan way in which we're doing this. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we will now turn to our first panel of witnesses. It is the Committee's policy that all witnesses uh, to offer testimony yet to be sworn. Uh, will the witnesses please stand and raise your right hand as I administer the oath. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this committee is the truth, the, tr the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record show that the witnesses have each answered in the affirmative. I'm going to ask uh, you to bear with me while I do two brief introductions. Uh, Mr. John E. Potter serves as the Postmaster General and CEO of the United States Postal Service. Mr. Potter was named the 72nd Postmaster General of the United States of America on June 1, 2001. He currently sits on the Postal Service Board of Governors and is Vice Chairman of the International Post Corporation, an association of 23 national posts in Europe, North America, and the Asia Pacific. Mr. Philip Herr is currently the Director of Physical Infrastructure Issues at the United States Postal excuse me, the United States Government Accountability Office. Uh, since joining GAO in 1989, he has managed reviews of a broad range of domestic and international programs. His current portfolio focuses on programs at the Department of Transportation and the U.S. Postal Service. Mr. Potter, you're now welcome to, to offer a five-minute statement. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the, the committee. For the past two years, I have testified about the dire financial situation facing the United States Postal Service. Today, we stand on the brink of financial insolvency, and our cumulative losses could exceed $238 billion by 2020. I am pleased to report that the Postal Service does have a plan for action to close the growing gap between revenues and expenses. However, before discussing our plan, I'd like to comment on a recent audit by our Inspector General concerning the Postal Service overpayments to the Civil Service Retirement System Pension Fund. The IG's report is of such significance that it could have an enormous bearing on the speed with which we need to make changes outlined in our plan. The IG found that an inequitable and unreasonable cost-sharing methodology was used when the former Post Office Department was reorganized in the postal, into the Postal Service. That methodology caused the Postal Service to contribute a disproportionate share of CSRS pension costs, resulting in a $75 billion overpayment. We support the IG's recommendation for dividing the responsibility of funding CSRS retirements for our employees by splitting the total pension obligation between pre- and post-1971 employment. Refunding the $75 billion to the Postal Service would not eliminate the need for us to take additional actions, but it would lessen the immediate financial crisis we are facing. I urge you to take a close look at this critical issue as the first step in resolving the Postal Service financial challenge. The way Americans communicate has changed dramatically, and the Postal Service has got to change. Our management team, with the support and approval of our Board of Governors, has developed a responsive, ambitious, and balanced plan that offers a way forward for a fiscally sound Postal Service. To help close the forecasted $238 billion gap by 2020, our action plan has identified $123 billion of cost savings that are within postal control, and we are implementing those actions today. We're also focused on growth, and we're introducing new products and pricing incentives consistent with our mission, and we're expanding and modernizing our retail access. I am confident that these strategies and other steps from our action plan will allow the Postal Service to remain a viable and valuable entity into the future, allowing us to continue to maintain and finance universal service nationwide. However, we do need congressional help in some key areas to provide management with the flexibility to deal with our financial situation. Specifically, we request your assistance in restructuring the pre-funding of retiree health benefits, adjusting the frequency of mail delivery, providing the freedom to offer access to postal services in places other than traditional post offices, requiring arbitrators to consider the financial condition of the postal service, 
applying the consumer price index price cap to all market dominant products as opposed to on a class by class application. Introducing not new products consistent with our mission and finally helping us to acquire more streamlined oversight. The first two of these proposed changes will generate the largest and most immediate financial benefits and move us toward narrowing our financial gap. If Congress is unable to act this fiscal year on broader legislation, our projections show that we will risk running out of cash early in fiscal year 2011. Therefore, should there be insufficient time this year to pass comprehensive legislation, the Postal Service will require a reduction in our retiree health benefit trust fund payment this year similar to 2009. We recognize that our agenda is ambitious and that the challenge will be finding the right balance between taking actions necessary to mitigate our financial crisis while at the same time implementing a smooth transition for our customers and our employees. The GAO recognizes the challenge facing us too. In their recently released report on the Postal Service, they do a thorough job of reviewing a series of complex issues and, and strategies for long-term structural and operational reform. I am pleased that many of the GAO's findings are consistent with the, analyses, with the analysis in the Postal Service Action Plan and that the GAO agrees with us that we need congressional action on removing some of our current legal and regulatory constraints. One area where we disagree with the GAO is their recommendation that additional panels of experts or commissions be established to develop legislative options or proposals for change. Due to the urgency of our finances, we cannot support this. We believe that a sufficient body of evidence exists to help guide the Congress on the changes needed for the future. Our action plan provides us a solid path to ensure that the Postal Service remains strong, healthy, and viable into the future. Our challenges are urgent, and I look forward to working with the Congress, the GAO, the PRC, and the entire postal community in implementing the best choices for success. Thank you for your support of our ongoing efforts to ensure a sound Postal Service, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Mr. Hur, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Members Issa and Chaffetz, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to participate in this hearing and discuss GAO's report that was released this week. Today, I will focus my remarks on the Postal Service's financial condition and forecast and strategies and options to facilitate progress toward its financial viability. Turning first to the Postal Service's financial condition. As mail volume declined by 36 billion pieces in fiscal years 2007 through 2009, the Postal Service's financial viability has deteriorated, leading to $12 billion in losses. Current forecasts are that mail volume will, de will decline to 167 billion pieces this fiscal year, the lowest level since 1992. The Postal Service projects a record loss of over $7 billion this fiscal year while adding $3 billion in debt. Its outstanding debt will increase to $13.2 billion, close to its $15 billion statutory limit. The Postal Service does not expect mail volume to return to its former levels when the economy recovers. The continuing shift to electronic communications and payments has fundamentally changed how mail is used. By fiscal year 2020, the Postal Service projects further volume declines to 150 billion pieces, the lowest level since 1986. First-class mail volume is projected to decline by another 37 percent over the next decade. And less profitable standard mail, primarily advertising that is subject to economic fluctuations, is projected to remain roughly flat over the next decade. Turning to actions needed to facilitate the Postal Service's financial viability. In July 2009, GAO added the Postal Service's financial condition to our high-risk list and reported that action is needed in multiple areas for the Postal Service to make progress toward financial viability. We identified strategies and options that fall into three major categories. First, compensation and benefits currently represent 80 percent of Postal Service costs, presenting cost savings opportunities. In terms of retirements, about 162,000 postal employees are eligible to retire this fiscal year, and about 300,000 are expected to retire over the next decade. In terms of benefit costs, postal employees have about 80 percent of their health benefit premiums paid, 8 percent more than most federal employees. Second, cost savings can be achieved by consolidating processing and retail networks given mail volume declines. 
Removing excess capacity is necessary in the 600 processing facilities where first class mail processing capacity exceeds needs by 50 percent. The network of 36,500 retail facilities can also be reduced. Maintenance has been underfunded for years, resulting in deteriorating facilities and a maintenance backlog. Approximately 30 percent of postal revenue currently comes from stamps purchased at non-postal locations such as grocery stores, indicating the customers have begun shifting to alternatives. Another opportunity is consolidating the field administrative structure by reviewing the need for 74 district offices and an additional eight area offices. And because cost cutting alone will not ensure a viable postal service, generating revenue through pricing and product flexibility is needed. The new flat rate priority mail boxes are an example of how the Postal Service has successfully generated new revenues. Turning to our reports matters for congressional consideration. To facilitate progress in difficult areas, such as realigning postal operations in its workforce, Congress may wish to consider an approach similar to a BRAC-like commission used by the Department of Defense. Congress has previously turned to panels of independent experts to restructure organizations and establish consensus. We believe a commission could also help to ensure that Congress and stakeholders have confidence in resulting actions. We also suggested Congress consider change in two other areas. One would be to revise the statutory framework for collective bargaining to ensure that binding arbitration takes the Postal Service's financial condition into account. Another change to consider is modifying the Postal Service's retiree health benefit cost structure. We believe it's important that the Postal Service fund its retiree health benefit obligations to the maximum extent its finances permit. Currently, about 460,000 retirees and their survivors receive this benefit, and another 300,000 postal employees are expected to use it by 2020. In considering revisions, it will be important to assess what the Postal Service can afford, strike a fair balance of payments between current and future ratepayers, and determine how changes would affect the federal budget. Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, no single change will be sufficient to address the Postal Service's pressing challenges. The longer it takes to realign the Postal Service to the changing use of the mail, the more difficult change will be. This concludes my prepared statement, and I'm pleased to answer any questions that you or members of the committee have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I now yield myself five minutes uh, for questions. And Mr. Potter, uh, one of the central considerations here is to shift to a five-day delivery uh, model. Uh, and that, that concerns me greatly, both with respect to the idea of universal service uh, and also the impact on employees within the Postal Service and how we're going to manage this if that's the direction that we go in eventually. Uh, now, I know that I, I think during your tenure, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the post office has already reduced uh, the size of your workforce by about 200,000 employees since 2001, which I, I believe is when you came in. Uh, and no one can argue that you haven't done uh, a significant job here uh, in terms of reducing the size of the workforce. I think it was 900,000. Now it's about 700,000, maybe a little less. Uh, so there's been significant downsizing already, or right-sizing, as some people have, have described it. But uh, this shift to from six-day to five-day, if it were to be embraced, can you lay that out for me? I know, uh, look, I come from a postal family. You know that. Uh, letter carriers mail handlers, clerks, what's the shakeout on that uh, and uh, what do you see as the, the, the impact of that, that change? Well, first of all, let me say I'm, I'm very sensitive to some of the comments that uh, Congressman Chaffetz uh, said in his opening remarks. Uh, but I think the Postal Service is positioned today, best positioned today to make the change in frequency of delivery. The reason I say that is because I believe that today we could accomplish that without laying off a career employee. We have flexibility in our, our system right now. We have a lot of folks who are eligible to retire. Uh, today, on the National Association of Letter Carriers side of the aisle, the city carriers, we have some 13,000 non-career employees who were hired knowing that their jobs would be eliminated at some point in time. 
So that transition for those 13,000 is, 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 you know, can happen immediately. Uh, we have use of overtime today uh, to the tune of some 9,000 you know, full-time equivalent employees. We can tighten up on that. We have a, a high number of people who are eligible to retire who could be incented to go. On the rural carrier side, we have the way most rural carrier routes are constructed, the sixth day of delivery is provided by a, a non-career employee. So I think that the time for change on frequency of delivery is now because it can be accomplished without laying people off. If we wait too long in the future, those, a lot of those non-career employees that I just described on the, on the city side, the flexibility to use them is limited and it will go away. And so we would position ourselves to have to hire uh, career employees in the interim. Uh, I think we're about a year away from having to hire to keep our, our routes staffed. And the time to change is now. Uh, and if we did make a hire within a year, those folks would be obviously uh, people who would have to be laid off later on in the, in the process. So uh, my opinion, there is a need to address the fact that we are delivering less mail per day. We delivered five pieces on average when I first came into the business. We're down to four pieces of mail per day being delivered, and it's on its way to three based on the Boston Consulting Group's forecast. If you look in using $2,009, we were delivering $1.80 per day per delivery.